One more race to go for the 2024 Formula One season, and then it's on to 2025. Don't forget, we're going to talk some NASCAR once again next week if you're a NASCAR fan. But we do have one more race to go for the F1 season. We will return before the 2025 season begins to let you know what's going on in the offseason at least once, maybe even twice here on ProLine TV. CJ, we're doing joining us from rotowire.com. And uh, CJ, how about Max Verstappen? Just uh, he's not going away. He's got a championship and he's still winning races. Max is back. Yeah. Um, we've been talking about it for a few weeks. Red Bull Racing seems to have discovered what was ailing their car and holding Max back. Uh, was a little bit skeptical given Brazil, the weather conditions there and just being such a crazy race. Uh, but I think last week at uh, Qatar certainly proved that they are back on form. There was a change also to the rules um, that affected McLaren over the past couple of races. So I think it might've been two different things that, that kind of brought Max and Red Bull back into the fold. But yeah, looking ahead to Abu Dhabi this last race of the year, uh, Max Verstappen having wrapped up the championship in Las Vegas, looking ever more the worthy champion uh, versus just getting an unassailable lead at the beginning. He is actually back when the team is back and winning races here as we close out the year as well. Yeah, there's also a constructor, a constructor's uh, title. So uh, we're going to get into that uh, in just a little bit. Um, but before we do that, I'm popping this up because believe it or not, we talked about, I thought we weren't going to talk about this anymore, but I just figured I'd, I'd pop it on just, just for shits and giggles. This is the futures odds for 2025. And we talked last week about everybody was three to one. And well, that's already changed. Yeah. They didn't, nobody listened to our advice because they went ahead and just put money on Max Verstappen already. <laughs> and Max is already the leader. I guess they needed him to win the race last week. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> it had to do with 2025, why his odds changed, but they did. And uh, yeah, I mean, could you see any reason at all why winning last week's race would have changed anybody's mind regarding the car for next season? No, I think it's more just the fact that Red Bull is starting to come back on top. And we've been so conditioned over the past couple of years that Red Bull and Max Verstappen are the team to beat that if they're coming back, apparently we have very short memories. Um, so I, I, it was one small change with uh, McLaren that, that they made that made them competitive. Ferrari uh, is maybe just half a step, maybe even half, not even half a step Uh you know, behind Red Bull and, and McLaren at this point as well. We've got the whole off season to go. And I think the, the cars are way more competitive. The drivers much more competitive. So I think 25 can still be another very competitive season. And man, it's auto racing. You never know what's going to happen every single week. So uh, very difficult here in December to predict out what we're going to be at in November or December of next year to to say the least. So I would not be putting any money on anyone at this point, except for perhaps George Russell, who you've got on the screen now uh, at 10 to one, actually looking pretty good there, given Mercedes ability to win races this year as well. Yeah, uh, I actually uh, lowered this because I just wanted to, I was just seeing if anybody else's odds changed. And I, and I realized I'm not even sure if we talked about, I don't think we talked about Liam Lawson last week. We did not. So who, he's 35 to one. He's actually with some of the more known drivers. So what's up with that? So speculation uh, of a couple of things that are going on. First of all, I think it's become much more apparent given uh, Sergio Perez and his inability to match Max Verstappen's form. Despite the fact that he's got another year on his contract, at least at Red Bull, I think after Abu Dhabi, the chances are either he's going to volunteer to walk away, uh, just quit, or... Red Bull is going to see him out and the potential for somebody to step in like Liam Lawson uh, could come into the fold and potentially put them into the championship race. Again, though, you're talking about a relative newcomer to the sport, uh, to the series, going up head to head against somebody like a Max Verstappen, even Lando Norris, Oscar Piastri, Lewis Hamilton switching teams and Charles Leclerc. It's going to be a very tall order for somebody like Liam Lawson to come in and actually have a shot at the championship. All right. I'm also uh, taking a look uh, over at the uh, newsletter, the email I get from uh, the Prime Tire email. And um, so they're talking about the race. And um, they mentioned here 
uh, about Verstappen, you know, winning this, despite taking the grid penalty. Mm-hmm. And uh, talking about a harsh penalty on Lando Norris nearly ruined his race. It all left the FIA <laughs> facing even more scrutiny this morning. So we pop that up. And there you go. Qatar penalty drama will increase scrutiny on the FIA after recent upheaval. What's up? With, what's going on there? We talked about it a couple of weeks ago uh, heading into Las Vegas. I think it was the race director was abruptly fired. And I think you saw what can happen when you have a new race director with Qatar. So during the race, uh, a rearview mirror popped off a car on the front straight. And it was sitting there. It was kind of off the line, but it was sitting there at the fastest part of the, of the track, the only place where you've got a DRS zone. And the FIA did not, none of the officials, the race director, did not call a caution for <clears throat> several laps. So teams actually came out into the pits ready for their cars, for their drivers to come in to be able to pit under caution. Uh, but it never came. So eventually a couple of the guys came in and, and pitted. And then as as those pit stops were cycling through, that's when the FIA <clears throat> decided to throw the caution. Uh, so it was kind of a m- minute of indecision there on the race director's part to throw the caution or not. Obviously, uh, somebody did hit it. I think it was Valtteri Bottas. So it ended up being a, you know, exploded uh, rear view mirror versus just a whole rear view mirror sitting out on the track. And there were a couple of punctures that came as a result of that. And quite honestly, um, with the race, the the race up until that point was relatively boring. Yeah, Max Verstappen had a one place grid penalty. He was still on the front row and he still got the lead going into the first corner, though. So there wasn't much of a race up until that point. But once you had the failure, once you tire failures, once you had that um, caution period, then you started getting uh, the better racing because the field was bunched back up again. You had some people that were out of order. Uh, Lando Norris um, ended up being penalized 10 seconds of uh, stopping in the pits for failing to slow down under a double yellow flag. Um, And actually, Max Verstappen was the one that noticed it because as they were going through that local yellow by the um, debris on the front straight, Max Verstappen actually realized that Norris got closer to him uh, in that section when you're supposed to be backing off of the throttle in the double yellow flag zone. So FIA looked at it, race directors looked at it, ended up penalizing Lando Norris for it. Um, They said that double yellow flags, that's a safety thing. So therefore it's going to be at the harsher end of the penalty guidelines. And therefore he got the 10 second penalty and uh, yet again, kind of gifted the gifted the the race win to Max Verstappen. He didn't really have much of a challenge after that point. Okay, so I completely get the whole idea of uh, not slowing down for a caution, but I, I don't get this. So, all right. So here it says um, Verstappen was stripped for a pole position for allegedly driving too slowly. <laughs> this ahead was, of, this was silly ahead of George Russell in qualifying resulting in an unusual one place penalty. So how do you how do you get <laughs> a penalty for driving too slow in qualifying? Explain this please. So in qualifying, um, they have three sections of qualifying, Q1, Q2, and Q3, and you get, you slim the field down as you go, similar to how NASCAR and, and IndyCar do it. Um, as cars are on the track, the, within Formula One, you'll do three laps at a time. You'll come out of the pits. It'll be a warm-up lap. You'll do your fast qualifying lap, and then you'll have a cool-down lap as you go back into the pits. And you can do that a couple of times before time runs out in any given session. So on those warm-up and cool-down laps, they want you to keep out of the way of the drivers that are on fast laps. So they've instituted rules and potential penalties if you impede another driver. Okay. And what is so controversial about this one is that both drivers were actually on their cool down laps. So neither one of them was on a fast lap. But okay. because um, the traffic happened to be uh, kind of a bottleneck at that point and Russell was coming through and he was at a faster pace than Verstappen, uh, apparently Russell complained in the driver's meeting afterward and officials looked at it and deemed that Max Verstappen was driving too slow impeding progress and therefore demoted him one place on the grid he otherwise would have been starting on pole so yeah i've never seen a penalty i've seen penalties everybody's seen penalties for impeding never have we seen a penalty for impeding somebody on their cooldown lap though so uh 
you know, I'll leave it to you to decide <laughs> what and why. Well, but it's kind of farcical. Yeah, I mean, you would think this might have something. This might be something that would uh, come back next year. I think it absolutely will. Yeah. And uh, what's interesting is George Russell is the head of the Grand Prix Drivers Association. So he's kind of the voice of the drivers to the officials and to the FIA. For somebody who holds that position and kind of speaks on behalf of all the drivers, Verstappen's point was, you know, this was, it, it didn't affect the outcome. Uh, it shouldn't have been raised, but the only reason it was raised was because Russell complained and whined about it. So uh, that's why Verstappen is saying he's lost all respect for Russell. Um, this is definitely going to grow over the winter and into 2025 for sure. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me like, uh, I don't know, like, uh, like the whole NASCAR qualifying thing has really gotten weird. I don't like it. I don't like no. the whole splitting it up into two groups and all that. It's just, it's too confusing for me. I, I just, I don't know. It, it, it's not even good television. You know, I just, I don't understand why they do that. Um, and, 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 and yet you would think that in F1, if they're going to have these cool down, you know, periods and spots on the track and everybody's driving fast and slow. And it's like, why are they all driving at the same time? Why don't <laughs> they just drive at different times? I mean, it's a damn I mean, this is this is this is not a, a NASCAR oval. I mean, this this is difficult racetracks that these guys are driving in with all sorts of turns. I don't. I mean, why why don't they take their? Why don't they just go? Okay, just like a NASCAR, you go first. <laughs> you know, you go second. Why don't they do that? I don't understand. They've flirted around with that. So it, qualifying used to be like I, I think it was sixty minutes and or, or twelve laps, basically whatever came first. So basically, you got four shots at your fastest lap and you had to get them all within 60 minutes and traffic was traffic. Um, so you, you know, gamble on going early or later. Um, you'd want to go as late as possible because more rubber would be on the track. The track would be cleaner. Um, but then you have more traffic potentially on that. So um, Michael Schumacher dominated that. Uh, it also led to absolutely no track activity to the last five or 10 minutes. Um, so they've flirted around. Oh, okay. Minutes things like that. And for a season or two, <clears throat> they actually did. You got one shot and, and it started, you know, one after another. As the other, as a person ahead of you was coming in, you went out and it was one lap, one lap, one lap, one lap, all the way through all the drivers. But um, they yet again decided that they want to keep tinkering with things. So I think they just suffer from the same issue as NASCAR does um, with that. It, they're, they're trying to spice up the show on a day when there's not a, an otherwise race going on. So they want to try to make it as exciting as possible. They want to encourage cars to be on track. They want to encourage, um, you know, teams and drivers trying different strategies to get the most out of it. But at the same time, you know, it's a balancing act because everybody's going to be trying to go for those optimal conditions. And like you said, it's really, these are difficult tracks and there are parts where cars just can't get out of the way and it, yeah. it's what it is. So we've seen penalties in the past where, uh, you know, a driver is trying to get out of the way, but they happen to be on a section of track where it just doesn't allow them to, and they end up getting penalized. So it is frustrating. I think you've got to have some kind of leeway within the rule book to be able to account for these types of things. I don't think for stopping should have been penalized. I also don't think that Norris should have been 10 second penalized in the pits as well. Uh, but that's what you get when you replace your race director uh, two weeks prior, <laughs> I guess. So a lot of questions actually going on in the FIA too, which uh, with the with the changes of the race director, there are some proposals that um, the president of the FIA is making on things such as ethics and um, financial improprieties and things like that. Basically, any kind of complaint that comes up through about the president is going to have to be handled by the president. So it seems like a conflict of interest to me. I think uh, there's a tug of war for power over the sports, certainly in the F on the FIA side that is going on, that unfortunately we're seeing play out uh, with race directors and kind of inconsistent officiating. Yeah, the, the, I mean, I know what to, I, I get the idea of trying to make things interesting, but the fact of the matter is, I mean, it's practice 
And I don't think anything you, you can attempt to do to make things interesting is going to work when it's just practice. I mean, how interesting can you make practice, you know? Exactly right. And that's why I say I think it's the exact same dilemma that NASCAR has. I think the true fans that want to see the cars and are interested in it are going to come no matter what. Um, I think it's the casual fans that they're really changing everything around to be attractive too. And they're not they're not your core. They're not your base. Yeah, they're an extra cherry on top. But yeah, play to your strengths, play to your base. Um, the true fans will come out for it. Uh yeah, definitely. There's, uh, I mean, we, we've talked about this in NASCAR tour right in the face. So uh, I'm sure there are the same issues in F1. Okay. Let's now talk about the race and the odds for the last race of the season at Abu Dhabi. And Max is the favorite right now. And Lando, so instead of three or four drivers, we're like last week, there's only two. So this makes it a little bit easier to wager on now. Uh, Max, he's on a winning streak here, isn't he? Yeah, um, he has won the last four uh, Abu Dhabi races. And it's interesting, um, the last three out of the four races, the winner has led all but one lap, I think. Oh, exciting. Yes, very exciting. <laughs> this track does have two DRS zones, two optimal passing zones. Uh, but the middle part of the track is just difficult to get a pass in. And if you if you nail it, if you start, you know, from pole, chances are good. If you make it to the first turn, chances are good <laughs> that you're going to end up winning the race. And therefore, so I that's the moment of the race. Watch <laughs> that first lap. Watch that, that first, first turn. Lap. That first turn, whoever comes <laughs> out ahead, unless they throw it away later on down the road uh, for some mistake, they're they're likely going to win. Uh, and I think uh, in all likelihood, you're going to see Max Verstappen and Lando Norris um, occupying the front row, unless for some reason Ferrari just throws everything against the wall with the championship for the constructors still in play and they end up getting Leclerc up there. Uh, but I think Max Verstappen this week, you know, given the changes to the McLaren that have slowed them down, uh, Red Bull getting on top of their car, I do think Max Verstappen is a good play and certainly should be the favorite this week at Abu Dhabi. All right. How about a long shot, which uh, I guess most of these other drivers besides the top two would be sort of considered long shots. You really only yeah. have these five here. So who would you go with out of these five? I would say Leclerc or Russell, but more so actually the, the difference isn't great between the two. So you know, you flip a coin, Leclerc, Russell, Leclerc's got a little bit more um, motivation because he's sticking with Ferrari and Ferrari, if, as long as they finish or not as long as, but they're going to want to finish ahead of McLaren, uh, Oscar Piastri and Lando Norris in order to catch the catch them in the constructors title. Um, but uh, George Russell and that Mercedes has been very fast the past couple of weeks. And this is kind of a similar track that we saw at Qatar. Uh, so I do think that George Russell could have uh, something to say, but they're going to have to figure out what their race pace problems are because they went backwards once the race got underway. George Russell was fast in qualifying at the one lap speed, but over a race distance just couldn't match uh, Verstappen and, and the McLarens. So we talked uh, just a little a bit what well, we mentioned the constructor the constructors title so uh talk a little bit about that it looks like here um so what do you have uh mclaren's got the lead where they got the lead over ferrari by 21 points 21 points so uh i think if mclaren gets a solid double points finish so if norris and uh, Piastri both finish where they traditionally have been around the top six. I think they stand a really good chance of holding off Ferrari. Um, Ferrari, 44 points are what's available uh, in terms of the weekend for constructors. And so Ferrari to get a full 44 points, they would have to win the race, finish second and capture the point for fastest lap. That clearly would be enough to overtake McLaren in the points. But even still, McLaren, I think, needs like a third and fifth or maybe it's a third and a sixth place finish out of their two drivers to be able to, uh, no matter what Ferrari does, um, hold them off. Uh, so basically, realistically, what needs to happen is that both Ferrari drivers need to finish in front of both McLaren drivers and hopefully win the race, if not double podium there. So it's going to be a stretch for Ferrari to do it. I think McLaren's got it in their hands as long as they don't have any major mistakes. 
Uh, they just basically have to go out and do what they've been doing, not make any mistakes and put the pressure on Ferrari to perform at their absolute best and do another one two uh, finish like they've done a couple of times this year. So what is the deal? I mean, I don't remember us looking at the uh, at the team odds and seeing double podium finish. <clears throat> why, why, why are we showing double podium finish now for, for the uh, team? That bet is to put both drivers finishing on the podium. So first, second or third. So again, McLaren and Ferrari, um, Ferrari basically need to do that in order to win the championship. So uh, I'm not sure what you saw, what the what the odds were for Ferrari to to win the championship. But if you compare, yeah, that, I can't. That's what I'm saying. I can't, I don't know where they are. I would thought no, they would have been I, here. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, that's probably. I, I guess that's where I would put uh, the same odds. <clears throat> for them to win the championship, maybe a little bit higher because you've got to have some problems from McLaren. Uh, so that could be your proxy. Um, so yeah, uh, I, like I said, I think the pressure is on Ferrari to do that. I, honestly, I don't even think with Max Verstappen being as good as he is right now and, and Russell and then both Ferraris, you know, trying to gun for that, um, um, that constructors championship. I don't think McLaren or Ferrari for a double podium finish is a good bet. I'd probably look at when they release the um, odds for the constructors championship. Maybe took a look at take a look at the difference there. Though I do think McLaren's got it in hand as long as they go out and do what they've been doing. It's going to be theirs. Pressure is going to be all on Ferrari. All right, so uh, we are done talking Formula One as far as the 2024 season is concerned here on our new channel, Proline TV. Uh, again, if you want to check back in 2025, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. So it'd be a nice little reminder uh, when we come back and we have some off-season coverage because we will. Uh, and then also if you're a NASCAR fan, we're going to return for the last time talking about either F1 or NASCAR for 2024 when we take a look at generally everything took place, silly season, and even the last few days, the last week or two, uh, with news about how the teams are shaping out for 2025 and NASCAR and the Cups, especially in the Cup Series. So uh, there'll be a lot to talk about next week as far as NASCAR is concerned. And I'm happy because uh, I've deliberately stayed away from all the news. I just I figured if I, when I'm going to do this, I knew the show was coming. I was going to wait until, you know, maybe like a day or two before we have to do our show to kind of just get familiar with what's going on. But I'm going to leave all that, a lot of it up to you, of course. <laughs> uh, so... Um, but I'll have questions, a lot of questions, and uh, I'm real interested to find out what's going on, especially like I'm seeing these videos pop up about all sorts of weird stuff happening. So I haven't had time to watch any of them, but I will get caught up. It should be a lot of fun. And uh, and again, for you uh, F1 fans, uh, hopefully you'll come back. We'll have a much bigger year next year with the new channel, new resources, and so on. So uh, for everybody that's uh, watched us for this entire season, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, CJ, uh, likewise, uh, as far as F1 fans, uh, you being the F1 uh, uh, master here, I appreciate all of your time uh, of our first F1 season. Yeah, thank you for helping me out through it. I uh, really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody who's- I'm learning. And looking forward to 25. Hopefully, ha hopefully we have another very competitive season. We'll see. Yeah, that's right. That was, that was uh, the blessing, really was uh sort of around from the beginning of the year that's for sure yeah it was crazy <laughs> and again hey if you watched us you, you hopefully cashed in as well Absolutely. because we gave you some really good advice uh when uh, everybody started to panic except us on max verstappen so uh winning the championship which he of course has already done uh so for cj we're doing i'm greg de palma we'll see you next season next year again for f1 and for nascar fans uh, we'll see everybody next week